Uh, and thank you beforehand for all the efforts that's going into the play. Uh, it's a blessing to, that the people that do come, but it's probably more of a blessing to us, to our church, the camaraderie. We get around each other, and we smell each other. Well, I'm glad I'm up there, but you smell each other back here. But uh, if, uh, after, if you're able to bring food for the thing and maybe drop it off and then try to park down here so that, uh, like, guests that come in so they don't have to be looking for a place. So if we can kind of, you know, uh, do something like that, we'll have that south door unlocked. So uh, be, if you would be praying for that, praying for the play and everything, it's going a lot better than I thought two weeks ago, that's for sure. Yeah, always does happen, doesn't it? Okay, uh, give a little survey of Psalms, and unfortunately, you really can't do it in uh, 30, 40 minutes, but I'm uh, going to give it a shot. Uh, Psalms is probably the most favorite book of most, and that's because they just look at it from a devotional viewpoint. It becomes more uh, pertinent, more interesting if you look at, at it also as a doctrinal viewpoint, okay, two separate ways. Most people that teach the Bible, be they good, be they bad, doesn't matter, use the Bible or teach the Bible from a devotional, instructional, practical, spiritual viewpoint, okay? But when you look at the doctrine, it seems like the words jump off the page with more power. And that's why God gave us a Bible, first primarily doctrine, secondly instruction, Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us understand your words, help us to give a a good preview of Psalms, and that might um, uh, encourage us to study it, read it more, and to read it from your perspective. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Luke 24, the way the Jewish people divided the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, what they call the Scriptures, is in Luke 24, 44, where they divide it in three parts. The Law of Moses, the Prophets, and Psalms. Okay, now Psalms here is not limited to the book of Psalms, 150 Psalms. It's including all the wisdom books. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Okay, and so... But that's how uh, Jesus divided the Old Testament. So it's the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Okay, now as far as the numbering of the Psalms, sometimes uh, people jokingly mock the chapter and verse numberings. If you would look in Acts 13, they say, well, that didn't occur until, you know, I don't know, 1400. But if you would look in Acts 13, somehow... They had it numbered in some fashion, Acts 13, verse 33, where uh, Paul mentions the second psalm. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as is written in the second psalm. Okay, now to be technical, it's not Psalms chapter 2. Okay, a lot of times people will say that. And if you look at the Psalms, it's like the Jewish hymn book. It will be Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Psalm 3. Okay, there's a fellow that made fun of Ruckman. What was this guy's name? Was it Heimer? Hot Dog Heimers? I think it was him that uh, they have a little uh, plaque and before the door, and it says Psalms, plural, something, and it's quoting one psalm. And he joked... They should have known better. That should be singular. Okay, yeah, he's probably right, but who really cares? Okay, Hot Dog Heimer's had other issues. Okay, but still. Okay, now when you run through the Psalms, you'll see that it's Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Psalm 3, and it's got 150 Psalms. It's like a hymn book. And it's probably the most comforting book that uh, people go to. Psalms 23, we probably all, probably every funeral you've been to, you see Psalms 23 somewhere, either on the little papers or sometimes they read it at the graveside, Psalm 23. And that is a second coming psalm, if you look at it doctrinally. But uh, the book of Psalms is in the middle of the Bible, and it deals more with our heart than anything else in the Bible. Proverbs deals with our head. 
even though it doesn't limit it to the head. But Psalms really focuses on our heart. So I want to give you some basic facts about the book. You have 150 Psalms, 2,461 verses. Uh, Sometimes it's divided into five sections. Okay, you'll see in section one how in the reference Bible I have book one at the first psalm. And then in Psalm 42 will be book two. Okay, so that's like the second section as far as the way uh, it's often divided out. Psalm 73 would be have a little thing right before that one. Book three, book three. So like if you look in our hymn book, it will have the hymns divided in sections. Okay, where I have a little header at the top, second coming, devotional, spirit, or stuff like that. So it's sort of kind of like that. But we have several different authors of, of the book of Psalms. And it's probably the, Psalm, the book of Psalms runs the largest uh, uh, chronological time span than any book in the Bible. It's about, it has David as a, as a writer, Asaph. Solomon, Ethan, Moses, the sons of Korah. It's funny the sons of Korah are mentioned. You remember how bad Korah turned out. Okay, but I find it interesting that when you read the story of Korah, Dotham, and Abiram, Dotham and Abiram's children died when the earth swallowed up, but Korah's children, or sons, they took off running. And Korah was the instigator And so they probably knew that dad was, you know, either a sociopath or, man, we're not going to get caught up with this. We're out of here. And they hightailed it out of there before the earth opened up and swallowed up Korah and Dotham and Abiram. And then their kids died in the thing. And so it's it's kind of interesting that here's a bad guy and their sons turned out doing something special for the Lord. That tells us that you know, you can have good parents and bad kids and bad parents and good kids, and it's all a matter of the heart. So I find that interesting about the sons of Korah, and then a few unknown authors uh, as far as the Psalms. It's a collection of poems or songs written over a period of about 1,100 years. Job would be, covers about, you know, 30-some days, 40 days, minus the extra children that Mrs. Job had. Uh, Many of the songs were about uh, trials, trouble, tribulation, thanksgiving, and triumph. Uh, And that's why people often would go to the Psalms, because they see a happy ending. It gives them comfort. Paul wrote in Romans 15, verse 4, that uh, the things that are written aforetime were written for our learning and our comfort and our patience. And so I'd heard about one of these, uh, what we call them dry cleaners, uh, hyper-dispensationalists. They think the big sin is getting baptized in water. And these people are usually hyper-dispensational where they limit themselves to Paul's writings, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, all, just those 13 letters. And I heard one of these people was confessing to another lady that, hey, I, I've been reading Psalms and getting comfort. You know, oh, oh, that's terrible. You're reading nothing that, something that Paul didn't write. How terrible. Well, that's the mindset they get. Okay, and so it's, uh, even if you did limit yourself to Paul's writings, Paul said you ought to read the things written aforetime. Okay, so it's a, it's a favorite devotional book. Uh, how many of you... Uh, either now or in the past, would read one psalm a day. And so on the first day of the month, read Psalm 1, or 31, or 61, or 91, or 121, and then day two, so forth like that. So you're reading it every five months. How many of you have ever done that before? Anybody's done that? Okay, I've done that. Uh, and so that way you're reading through the psalms every five months. Okay, so it's easy to remember. Look at the calendar. Oh, this is the one I'm on this today. And, of course, uh, Psalm 119, you know, you get on the 29th day, that, you've got to give more time for that one. Well, on the 27th day, Psalm 117, that's only two verses, so you get done real quick. Okay, but uh, here, here's something about the Psalms. That the praise of the Lord is found 23 times. If you would, look in Genesis 30, verse 13. There are seven Psalms that will begin with the word, Blessed. Right in the front of it, seven of them. And according to Genesis 
30, verse 13, it likens blessedness to happiness. Okay, in, in Genesis 30, verse 13, blessedness and happiness are interchangeable. And so you have seven psalms to start with blessed. Psalm 1, right off the bat. Okay, Psalms 12, which is uh, the one that Bible believers usually know a couple of verses there. I'm sorry, not Psalms 12. The next one is Psalms 32, but in Psalms 12, we'll get to that one. Psalms 32, blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Uh, Psalm 41, 112, 119. Okay, Psalm 119 is uh, not the exact center verse of the Bible. It's just a little bit to the right of it. And it's like the heart of the Bible. Psalm 119 has 176 verses. It's divided in eight first sections. At the beginning of each section would be a Hebrew letter that's transliterated into English. So you have Aleph. There's one. Bet, I guess that's how they pronounce that. That's the second section. So it's got 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And this psalm, every single verse on the average mentions the Bible. Okay, I think there's one or two that doesn't mention it, but there's six or seven that mention it twice. Meaning commandments, laws, statutes, testimonies, precepts. Okay, and that's the heart of the Bible right there, right off the bat. Blessed are the undefiled in a way who walk in the law of the Lord. Now, we used to uh, have that for the kids club down at Rensselaer where we'd get them to memorize as many as they could. Uh, at one time, uh, Brent, Heidi, Ashley, Luke, I don't know if Lynn's did it. If she got, they had the whole thing memorized. Sam, Sam had it all memorized. Uh, did Lydia? She had it. Hannah? Lydia? Okay. But, uh, I mean, they would just buzz through it. I mean, you had to be a speed reader to keep up with them. They'd go through it so fast. But that is just choom right through there. And uh, that, that, you know, that's something that gets down in her heart. Okay, Psalm 119. Uh, Psalm 12 is uh, one for Bible believers. Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7 is what they usually know. They should usually have this one memorized, Psalms 12. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Okay, and uh, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Okay, another one that um, Bible believers usually mention is Psalm 138, verse 2. So just give a little general overview, and I'm going to slow down here when we get into the doctrine to help verify that. I'm sorry, what did I say, 132, 138 verse 2. Okay, this one, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. So God magnifies his word above his name. God, it doesn't say God magnified his translation above his name. It's a word. Some folks might say, well, that's Old Testament. Yeah, but if you go to 2 Thessalonians, it says we are to glorify the word. So that's for us New Testament right in there. Okay, now the primary doctrine. Now this is where if you read through the Psalms, it will make, the Psalms will make more sense. If when people limit themselves to the devotional aspect of the Bible, okay? What they're doing is they're crunching the Bible down and they have to overlook 90% of the Bible. And if you attend these churches, you're going to see that they only preach from certain passages. You won't see them preaching from any of the minor prophets ever. They won't even touch on the minor prophets. They don't understand them. If you avoid the doctrine of the Bible... Uh, they'll preach on, you know, you're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay. They'll just preach on motivational things. When I was at Hiles Anderson, there's a Jack Hiles' son-in-law, Johnny Murphy. He taught in church ed class, church education class. It was a class everybody, all the guys had to have every, every day 
every time we were there. And he said, I'm going to tell you what Jack Hiles preaches. He preaches 25 topics. That's all he preaches. He will keep going over the 25 topics. He never preached on the second coming of Christ. He never preached on prophecy. We, Jan and I was there for three years. I never heard them mention the rapture, never heard them mention the second coming of Christ, and I wasn't sleeping, okay? He had 25 topics, and you just go over and over, and those 25 topics were just there to keep motivating people to stay busy, 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 bringing others into the kingdom, his kingdom, okay? And that was it. Verse by verse, they knew nothing about. They had no idea of going verse by verse in the Bible. And when I left there and I got to Colorado starting dealing with people and they started throwing these Acts 2.38 stuff to me and Hebrew stuff, and I'm thinking, I don't know what the answer is. And that's, you know, when I started figuring out, boy, I wasn't taught much. Okay, and I, you know, I studied. I worked at it. You know, I, Jan was... Uh, third in our class, I think second, second or third, and Anderson was first, get that, Hiles, Anderson, uh, she got first, and she, she deserved it, she's a good, good student, and I was around 13, 14, something like that, okay, and so, I mean, we, we studied hard, we, looked, we took it seriously, we wanted to serve the Lord the best way we knew how, but we were not taught, doc, taught doctrine at all, no doctrine, zero doctrine, except Baptist doctrine, and they try to make Genesis Revelation all Baptist doctrine, okay? And that don't work. It don't work. And this is why when they get out under the ministry and their faith gets shook, is because they have no doctrinal foundation. They might run their charismatic. They might run here. They might run there because they don't know the difference, and what saved my hide, spiritually speaking, is I came across doctrine through Ruckman. And I came across this stuff, and I said, man, that's what I've been looking for all these years. This is wonderful. First commentary I read from Ruckman was Hebrews, and you're not supposed to be reading that one, the first one. And boy, when I read that, I said, oh, that's the answer. I knew them Pentecostals were wrong. And then I, you didn't have to add a word to the Bible, change a word, didn't do anything as far as just believe what it said to whom it was spoken. Okay, now Psalms doctrinally. Okay, the primary doctrine of Psalms is no different than the ministry of Jesus, and it's the second coming of Christ. But what precedes the second coming of Christ will be the tribulation time period, Jacob's trouble, and so that's what many of the Psalms are writing about. Okay, so let's look at first the doctrinal viewpoint of the tribulation or second coming of Christ. What's the catch word? When you read through the Psalms, there's a word that's kind of a catch word that tells you and I, okay, we're dealing with tribulation or second coming. And the word is Selah. Okay, let's try a few of them. Okay, Psalms 3, verse 2. The word is Selah. When you see the word Selah, musical people say, will tell, that means rest. Okay? But doctrinally, that is a strong, strong hint from the Bible that you're dealing with the second, tribulation and second coming. And the reason why that's true is Selah or Selah Petra is a place in the place called Jordan, uh, modern-day modern Jordan, Bible word Edom, and that's where Jewish people are told to flee to the mountains, to the rock city. And that's, uh, when I went to Israel in 97, we didn't go to Jordan, but uh, that's part of the trip in June. Psalms 3, verse 1, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Trouble, trouble, Jacob's trouble. Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Selah. So we have just gotten into tribulation and second coming. Uh, verse 4, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. The holy hill, Zion. Selah. Think about that one for a while. 
That's what the Lord wants us to do. Okay, Psalm 7, verse 5. This is what makes the Psalms make sense. If you don't understand this, the Psalms don't make sense. A lot of these passages do not make sense unless you understand the doctrine. Psalm 7, verse 5. Let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. Yea, let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay mine honor in the dust. How does an American apply that? You know, the enemies that you have in America is basically they're talking behind your back. Okay, this is somebody whose life is in danger. Next verse, arise, O Lord. That's a prayer for the second coming. Prayer for the second coming. Psalm 9, uh, verse 16. Uh, the Lord is known by judgment, by the judgment which he execute, executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. What is that, Higion or whatever? Selah. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. Second coming. Verse 19, arise, O Lord, prayer for the second coming. Who is being persecuted in the tribulation? Verse 18, needy and poor. Poor and needy. It's a common phrase. Poor and needy. You'll see that in, in uh, James. Okay, uh, verse 20, same psalm. Put them in fear, O Lord, that, that, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. Second coming. Okay, when you see these things, it makes a lot more sense. Psalm uh, 32, uh, verse 4. Uh, For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, my moisture is turned into the drought of uh, summer. Selah. This is a, a Jew suffering during the tribulation time period. Five, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, mine iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Second coming of Israel, restoration of Israel. Historically, it's David. David is a type of Christ. Saul is a type of the Antichrist. Okay, and Psalms will make more sense when we understand the doctrine written behind it. Psalm 46, verse 3. Uh, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Earthquake. Tribulation appearance. Tribulation, what's going on? Verse 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. Us, Israel, the God of Jacob, is our refuge. Selah. Jews of the tribulation time period. Okay, uh, 47 verse 4. We can keep going on these. Uh, he shall choose our inheritance. That's the inheritance of the Jews, restoration of Israel, for us. The excellency of Jacob, whom he loved. It's a political statement against the Muslims. Uh, 48, uh, you can see in verse 1 and 2, second coming, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth. Not today. That is not true today. The whole earth does not joy in Jesus Christ today. When is it going to happen? Millennium. Okay, and so looking forward to that day. Uh, verse 8, as we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord our God, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. Selah, second coming. And it's all through here. Uh, let's try... Isaiah. Let's step outside of Psalms here. Isaiah 16. Uh, even in America, down in uh, the hills of Tennessee, they'll put on their barn, see the Rock City. Now, the Rock City ain't Tennessee. Not the one that's going to be safe for the Jews. The Rock City is over there in Petra. You know, some of these guys that think they're going into tribulation, there's a couple in Australia that uh, a fella in a church where Huddy attends, it's his, it's his relative, and they think they're going into tribulation, and so he's got some YouTube clips, and he wanted me to make comments on there, and I said, hey, man, if you're going, if you're going into tribulation, here's my advice. I would uh, advise you to go to Jordan, secure some land, a house and some property, so that when you hear a big boom and some people are gone, you're still left, and you can run over to Petra and try to survive the tribulation. Make sure you get a bunch of food supplies over there. Have good luck. I mean, if that's what they're going to do, and he said, I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's right, because you don't look at any doctrine of the Bible. Isaiah 16, 
send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness unto the mount of the daughter of Zion. Okay, so who's going to come from there? Verse 4, let mine outcast dwell with thee, Moab. Be thou a covert to them from the face of the spoiler, for the extortioner is at an end. The end, endure to the end, shall be saved. The spoiler seetheth, the oppressors are consumed out of the land. That's the persecutors, the Muslims going after the Jews. And the outcasts are booted out. Uh, Habakkuk. Okay, let's try that one. Habakkuk. When you find it, raise your hand. Habakkuk. Habakkuk, Habakkuk. Or how they pronounce it? Habakkuk. Get some phlegm in your throat. Habakkuk. Okay, this is uh, this Habakkuk chapter 3 has the word Selah three times. Uh, in verse 3, it says, God came from Teman. I read uh, one commentary that Teman was some planet, someplace. So God lives on Teman. Okay, Teman, or Eliphaz the Temanite, that's a place known for wisdom. That's one of the guys that advised Job. Uh, the Holy One from Mount Paran, this is in Petra, near Petra. Selah, his glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Second coming. So Habakkuk chapter 3 is a prayer about the second coming of Christ. He uses the word Selah three times. Uh, verse 9, thy bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word Selah. And verse, look at verse 12, thou didst march through the land in indignation, thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou winnest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked. So he gets hit in the head, the Antichrist, by discovering the foundation under the neck, Selah. So these are all second coming. And it's somebody who is triumphed. Now, the somebody in the, in the Psalms is the Jews, will be the Jews. And it's a book about singing about the second coming of Christ. Okay, doctrinally, as I mentioned, it's aimed at the tribulation and millennium. The word faith isn't found in the entire book. Nowhere to be found. Okay, the word faith is only found twice in the Old Testament. The word grace only occurs two times in the entire book. Only two times for the word grace. And so this affirms something is different in the tribulation. Okay, as far as righteousness, how righteousness is attained. Okay, I mean, when you see those things in the Bible, and you see the changes that God makes of Deuteronomy 30 versus Romans 10, there's a reason for those changes. And when we understand the doctrines of the Bible, the Bible makes more sense. Now, there are entire psalms, that will write about certain events of the tribulation. If you would, let's try Psalm 79. Now, this one makes absolutely no sense unless you look at the doctrine. Psalm 79, this is a, this is a psalm about the uh, tribulation, or the great tribulation in particular. O God, the heathen are coming to thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. Oh, isn't that real comforting? Reading that, oh, wonderful. How does an American apply that? We don't apply it. We believe it. How do we believe it? Well, we recognize what he's writing about. Now, that verse right there, there was a, uh, when I first moved to Colorado Springs, Jan and I moved there late January, early February, uh, it's a, it's a fundy church because we didn't know anything else at that time. Uh, let's see. So we got there January, February, the previous December, November, somebody in that area broke into four churches and just decimated the buildings. Okay. And at the time that church, they, they thought they had done, uh, $300,000 worth of damage. Okay. So they came in, they took like honey and opened all the books and poured honey and pop and axes and beat the computers, you know. And then in those days, the computers were this tall and about this wide, had a whole big room for them, and didn't steal any money. Money was around. They didn't steal anything that we knew of. 
and just damaged that place, and they had $8,000 worth of insurance. So it really set them back. They found a Bible uh, in the auditorium where it was fell open to Psalm 79, verse 1. The heathen have come into thy, okay, the heathen are coming to thine inheritance. Now, of course, they quickly applied that to them, but it doesn't say thy holy church have they defiled. It says temple. So that's Jewish. Okay, now it took a, quite a while to recover from that. There were four churches that this happened to because Manitou Springs is where America's largest Satanist church is, underground. And so uh, this guy was, you know, pretty known, well-known uh, in the community, so somebody wanted to just mess with them, I guess you could say. But that was, is, you know, coincidentally, uh, that verse was laid open in a Psalm 79, okay, but verse 2 didn't happen. Okay, they could read that and say, yeah, the heathen have come into the church. But that's about all you could say. Because verse 2 didn't happen. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat on the fowls of heaven, the flesh of thy servants under the beasts of the earth. No, they didn't. That didn't happen in Colorado Springs when we were there. Their blood have they shed like water round about Colorado Springs. That's where Americans would think. If they look at that devotionally, it might get some comfort, but their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there is none to bury them. We are become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision of them that are round about us. How long, Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? That entire psalm is writing about that, the tribulation. Uh, if we would look in 11. Let the sighing of the prisoner come unto thee, come before thee. Who's in prison? Well, didn't the Lord say, you didn't visit me in prison? Why? Because you're throwing the Jews in prison, and it's going to save them for a sacrifice. And so this entire psalm, 13, uh, 13 verses, is about the great tribulation. How can we apply that doctrinally? Well, we just read it, believe it, and say, wow, glad I'm going to miss out on that. And I can get a lot of comfort out of that. But if you don't understand the doctrine of it, it doesn't make any sense. None whatsoever. So doctrine is what helps us out. Okay, Psalm 10, 52, and 109 are all psalms about the Antichrist, the second most popular character in the Bible. Psalms 10, and then there's other references to him, but the entire Psalm 10 is about him, the Antichrist, and things he's going to do. Uh, how do. We can't miss it. Verse 1, why standest thou afar off, O Lord? God has withdrawn himself, withdrawn himself. Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble, Jacob's trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor, Antichrist. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. And you read down through, uh, what's the Antichrist going to do? Verse 7, deceit, fraud. Deceit and fraud. Those are the two ways governments implement taxation. Deceit and fraud. That's the two ways. Psalm 10 is about the Antichrist. Psalm 52 is about the Antichrist. Psalm 73. Okay, let's skip those. Let's try Psalm 109. If someone is praying for you, I hope they're not praying this prayer. It is a biblical prayer. It's in the Bible. <laughs> but let's hope they're not praying this. Psalm 109. Uh, verse 4, for my love, they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. They have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at the right hand. <clears throat> when he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds, and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of the desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath, and let the stranger spoil his labor. Now, isn't that a, 
uplifting prayer. I'm praying for you, brother. Psalm 109. Hope you get a blessing out of it. <laughs> That's an Old Testament prayer. That's allowed, Old Testament, but it's doctrinally it's a prayer against the Antichrist. Psalm 109. Psalm 14 and 53 are about the workers of iniquity. That's the ilk that fulfill the Antichrist bidding. It could be flesh and blood people, but most likely it will be uh, demoniacs masquerading, shape-shifting as men and women. <clears throat> most likely that's where it's going. <clears throat> psalm 23, the great psalm in the second coming. <clears throat> it's a beautiful psalm. It's a psalm where more people get comfort more than anything. <clears throat> but unfortunately, the only ones who are going to get comfort are the ones who go to the millennium. You know, a lost man can have this read at his funeral, and it's not going to help him out at all. But the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay, so he's the shepherd on earth. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul, the restoration of Israel. He leadeth me in a path of righteous for his name's sake. sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no, fear no evil. Oh, so just previously he walked through the valley of the shadow of death, and he did fear evil, but now he's not fearing evil. Because... Previously, that was tribulation. That's Edom. He could walk through there and the death cloud pass over, the shadow of death, and it could throw out nuclear radiation on him and kill him. But now in the millennial time period, since Jesus is a king on earth, he can walk through the valley of shadow of death and have no fear because Jesus is a king on earth. And so when we look at those Psalms, and yes, the Lord will have enemies in the millennium, which is what we portray. Verse 5, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. That just blows my mind. How somebody can experience perfection of the millennium and still be enemy of Jesus Christ. That's the power of the flesh. Okay, so that's Psalm 23. Then Psalms 22 is a great crucifixion psalm. Okay, we'll stop there. And let's go and pray. Lord, I do pray and ask you to help us to... Uh, Understand your words, be faithful to them, and Lord, thank you for the hard work and efforts that's being done for the play, and we do ask that you'd be, we, we pray that you'd be pleased uh, with our efforts, that you might bless it, and Lord, we pray that you might be already preparing people's hearts to travel in and to uh, view this and be part of this, that it might be a blessing to them and might challenge them to either get saved or to walk with you um, closer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.